The Alaskan Malamute is the original sled dog of North America. The breed is an integral part of the history of the native Alaskan people. So much so that its very name is taken from that of a tribe of native Inuit. These hard-working dogs impressed early Russian explorers by their remarkable strength and endurance. You'll be seeing many Alaskan Malamutes during this presentation. Some are outstanding examples of the breed. Others are less so. But all are representative examples and will help your understanding of the Malamute. Now, let's begin. The Malamute's working heritage demands strength, endurance, and a tractable temperament. Remember in your judging of this breed that any individual characteristic that interferes with this work is to be considered a most serious fault. If the dog you're evaluating cannot withstand hours of heavy, difficult work, it's not a proper Malamute. In general appearance, the Malamute is a powerful and substantially built dog with a deep chest and strong, compact body. Alaskan Malamutes are not a man-made breed. They evolved naturally in a harsh Arctic environment in which survival demands an alert, independent nature. Consequently, while the Malamute is an affectionate, friendly dog and a loyal and devoted companion, he's not a one-man dog. He can be playful on invitation, but you should get an overall impression of dignity in a mature dog. Let's begin our detailed examination of the Malamute with the head. Here's a good example. The head must be in proportion to the size of the dog, so as not to make the dog appear clumsy or coarse. Overall, the head should indicate a high degree of intelligence. It is broad and powerful as compared to other natural breeds. The skull is broad between the ears, moderately rounded, narrowing gradually to the eyes. It rounds off to the cheeks, which are moderately flat. There is a slight furrow between the eyes. From the side, you can see there is a flattening of the skull as it approaches the eyes. There is little break from skull to muzzle. The muzzle itself is large and bulky in proportion to the size of the skull. There is only a slight diminishing in width and depth from its junction with the skull to the nose. The nose is black, although a snow nose is often seen in winter. How would you evaluate this dog's head? The muzzle is narrow and snipey. This is a fault. And what about this dog? The head lacks the proper breadth and power. And here, there is too much stop, which is accentuated by the tan markings. Here is a good Malamute head. Note again the slight furrow between the eyes. This is one example of the Malamute's suitability to its native environment. The furrow is caused by the formation of the skull and accentuated by connective and fatty tissue around the eye. This layer serves to protect the eye from a buildup of ice. There is a wide variation in acceptable Malamute head type. Here are several heads that are acceptable. Lips are close-fitting. The upper and lower jaws are broad, with large teeth, meeting in a scissor's bite. While it is not specified in the standard, complete dentition is desired. An overshot or undershot bite is a fault. The Malamute's eyes are brown in color, dark brown preferred. They're almond-shaped, and moderately large for this shape of eye. They're set obliquely in the skull, 
which gives the Malamute a soft, amiable expression. These hazel eyes are also seen, but the darker brown color is always preferred. These light round eyes are less desirable and should be faulted. Blue eyes are a disqualification. Here again are the correct Malamute eyes, dark in color, almond shaped, and moderately large. These are also correct Malamute ears. They're of medium size, but small in proportion to the head. See how the upper halves of the ears are triangular in shape and are slightly rounded at the tips. They're set wide apart on the outside back edges of the skull. The lower part of the ear joins the skull on a line with the upper corner of the eye. When the ears are erect like this, they have the appearance of standing off from the skull as opposed to a vertical ear. The ears will point slightly forward, like these are, when they're erect, but may be folded against the skull when the dog is at work. You can see how the ears have thick, well-furred leather. These ears are too large and are set too low. High-set ears should be faulted. Ear set, size, and placement help to determine the good Malamute expression seen here. Note also this dog's good proportions of muzzle and skull, close-fitting lips, and correct eye shape and placement. Now let's consider the Malamute's neck and body. The neck should be strong and moderately arched, like this. The correct arch of neck at the crest is important because it helps balance the dog. It also allows the animal to quench his thirst by scooping up snow in stride. Also, notice the moderate dewlap on this dog's neck. This too is related to the Malamute's environment, for it protects the windpipe and warms incoming air. The dewlap will usually be more apparent in males. This dog's neck is too short. When the Malamute is alert or in a show stance, the head is carried high, like this. When gating in the show ring, or when the dog is pulling a light load, the head will drop, so it's nearly level with the top line, like this. When the dog is pulling a heavier load, you'll see the head drop below the shoulder level. The shoulders themselves are well muscled and moderately sloping. There should be sufficient angulation to allow for good reach in front as the dog moves. This dog is too straight in shoulder. while this one lacks the proper muscling this breed's work requires. When judging this breed, it is important to feel for well-developed muscles. The chest is strong and deep, allowing plenty of room for heart and lung function. The forelegs are heavily boned and muscled right to the pasterns in comparison to the lighter bone of other northern breeds. The pasterns themselves are short and strong and should appear almost vertical from the side. While the standard calls for a nearly vertical pastern, there should not be any evidence of knuckling over. A Malamute that is down in pastern like this will never have the endurance required. The legs of the Malamute must show unusual strength. These are excellent examples of correct forelegs. These forelegs, however, are incorrect as they are too fine-boned and lack the necessary strength. The front feet are large and compact, with toes tight-fitting and well-arched, as seen here. Pads are thick and tough, 
and toenails short and strong. The snowshoe-like feet help the Malamute move efficiently through deep snow. There should be a protective growth of hair between the toes. What about this dog's feet? They are flat, which is a serious fault. Remember that any unsoundness in feet or legs, standing or moving, is to be considered a serious fault. Here is another example of the proper front assembly, with moderately sloping shoulders, powerful front legs, almost straight pasterns, and large, compact feet. The body is strong and compactly built, like this, but not short-coupled. The back is straight and gently sloping to the hips. This can best be assessed by seeing the dog gating from the side. The loins are well-muscled and moderately short, but not so short as to interfere with the typical, easy, rhythmic stride of the Malamute. This dog is too long in body. This dog is too long in loin. This tends to weaken the back and is a fault. The Malamute's heavy coat can give the illusion of a dip behind the withers. Be sure to feel with your hands to determine actual structure. Heavy coat over the rump can also be deceiving and may make the dog appear high in the rear when actually he is not. The tail is moderately set in a continuous line with the spine. It's well furred and carried over the back when the dog is not working. The tail is a plume, a distinctive feature of this breed. Tail length is another survival-related characteristic of the Malamute. The tail should be of sufficient length to cover the nose and legs when the dog is in repose. This is difficult to assess in the show ring. Sufficient tail length, that is, a tail that reaches at least to the hock, is seen here. This tail is too short. This dog's tail is incorrect. It lies too flat to the back. Remember, you should see daylight between the tail and the back. This one falls to one side of the body. This is a fault as are tails that are short-furred and carried like a fox brush. Natural tail set and carriage is best assessed while the dog is gating. This dog's tail is being carried correctly. Hind legs are broad and powerfully muscled through the thighs, like these. Stifles are moderately bent and hock joints are broad and strong, moderately bent, and well let down. This rear is over-angulated. There is too much rear angulation to balance with the front. This dog, however, is too straight in the rear. The legs of the Malamute must indicate unusual strength and tremendous propelling power. This dog is weak in the rear. Any indication of unsoundness in legs or feet, standing or moving, is to be considered a serious fault. Note that dew claws on the hind legs are not desirable and should be removed. Movement is the crucial test of any dog's conformation, but particularly so in the Alaskan Malamute. The Malamute's gait should be steady, balanced, and seemingly tireless. Malamutes should move with a proud carriage, with a rhythmic, powerful drive, and tremendous propelling power. Side gait is critical to the evaluation of correct Malamute structure. Coming toward you, the forelegs should move in a straight line, not thrown out to the side there should be a tendency for the legs to converge toward a central line of gravity as speed increases. 
The rear propulsion should be evident as the dog moves neither too close nor too wide. Note that a dog which is worked regularly may push off wide in the rear, but the legs will move closer as the dog realizes there is no load behind him. This dog is moving too close behind. This is incorrect front movement. The elbows are out and the feet toe in. This is incorrect side gait. The head is held too high for efficiency. The dog is out of balance, so the gait is not smooth. Here again is correct gait from the front. From the rear. And from the side. Steady, smooth, powerful, balanced. Notice the correct carriage of head, neck and tail and the firm top line. The Malamute's coat is a key protective feature. The double coat consists of a thick coarse guard coat and a dense undercoat from one to two inches in depth. The outer coat is off standing with a thick fur around the neck. The undercoat is woolly and oily to the touch. The guard coat will vary in length over the body, but it's generally moderately short to medium along the sides of the body, and somewhat longer around the shoulders and neck, down the back, over the rump, and in the breeching and plume. This dog's coat is not desirable. It's long and soft rather than thick and coarse, and should be faulted. This coat is in beautiful condition. The Malamute is a natural breed and should not be trimmed. Consequently, the scissoring up the back of this dog's leg is undesirable. Removal of whiskers is not preferred. Also note that Malamutes generally have shorter and less dense coats when they shed out during the summer months. Usual coat color ranges from light gray through intermediate shadings to black, with white on the underbody, parts of the legs, feet, and face. The only solid color allowed is all white. Markings on the head can be either cap-like, as seen on the left, or mask-like on the right. Some dogs may exhibit both of these kinds of markings in combination. This dog's small white blaze on the forehead and white spot on the nape is attractive and acceptable, as is a white collar. But broken color extending over the body in spots or uneven splashings is undesirable. A mantled dog is different from a splashed coated dog. There is a natural range of sizes in the breed. The desirable freighting sizes are, for males, 25 inches at the shoulders, and for females, 23 inches. As for weight, males should be 85 pounds, females 75 pounds. Even though the standard is quite explicit in this category, size should never outweigh proper type, proportion, and functional attributes. If you're evaluating two animals which appear to be equal in these characteristics, preference should be given to the dog nearest the standard's desirable freighting size and weight. Bear in mind, too, that dogs with correct coats may appear bigger than they really are. Dogs and bitches should be judged equally without regard to sexual differences in coat and size. It is imperative to remember that, in judging Malamutes, their function as a sledge dog for heavy freighting must be given consideration above all else. Alaskan Malamutes are working dogs and should never be shown in excess weight. In your judging of this breed, always bear in mind that the Malamute is by nature a pack animal. And as such, body language plays a large part in its reactions to other dogs and to humans.
He is not reserved or watchful like a shepherd, nor should he fawn for approval. His independent nature sometimes makes him stubborn in training, but you should always get an impression of great intelligence in an impressive, dignified animal. He's one of our true, natural breeds, a product of his environment, not human intervention. Good reason to prize this hardy native from the Arctic wilderness.